You're listening to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, your home for holistic, evidence-based cognitive enhancement strategies. And now your host, Eric Levi. Susan Owens, welcome to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast. Thank you. Uh, this is a very exciting podcast. I've been following your work for, um, for, for some time now. You run some really amazing uh, groups around the internet on Facebook, on Yahoo, focused on the study of oxalate. And, it, and, and I know a lot of your research is aimed at understanding oxalate. And I'll give you my quick story first, and it's probably a story you've heard a million times, but, um, you know, I've always, I shouldn't say always, but, you know, I've had this health journey for a while and I've become a health coach, I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner. And, you know, as I've become healthy, I feel better. I've lost weight. I look better. You know, all those metrics are fine. But then all of a sudden, all these little kind of nagging issues pop up with the skin and the sleep. For me, it was, um, you know, dark circles under the eyes and all kinds of just kind of random things. And recently, I took an organic acids test. And there was a number that came up. All of them were, were for the most part good, but the number that came up elevated above anything else was oxalic acid. And when I started digging into what is oxalic acid and what are oxalates, my mind was just blown about how much influence this, I, I, I don't know what it is. Is it a nutrient? It's a mineral? What, what, you it's can explain definitely what that is. not a nutrient unless you're a microbe that eats it. Right. So- so I found this to be elevated and I started following your work. And when I dove into your group and for the record, it, I'm following the Facebook group, trying low oxalates. And I found like this whole other world. I felt like I got transported to Oz, you know, and it was <laughs> like, I started following the yellow brick road down this path of understanding oxalate and understanding how many people are dealing with this and how many people are actually fixing so many nagging problems by starting to, to understand oxalate. So maybe we can start off by, by talking a little bit about, you know, your history as a researcher and an academic and, and how you got involved with understanding oxalate and, and really what is oxalate and, and why, why does it matter? Well, I kind of got involved through the back door. And um, first of all, um, I, I, was a caregiver for my father who had uh, dementia and for my daughter who was born with a lot of developmental issues. And so in trying to find help for them, I ended up the only place that people were doing research in, in that area was um, a Dr. Rosemary Waring at the uh, University, of, University of Birmingham in England uh, was studying sulfur chemistry. And I found that to be very applicable to both what was going on with my father and my daughter. And it was odd parallels, but also I began to um, connect with the autism research world. And, um, and in that way, they were just starting to use Epsom salts. And so those completely changed my, two, my, my father and my daughter just amazingly. And so um, when my daughter hit kindergarten, then I was ready to start graduate school and to try to figure out why it worked. And so I was studying really sulfate and sulfate's role in neurodevelopment. So I was doing an interdisciplinary degree looking at both um, neuroscience and cell biology to try to understand how all these molecules worked and what was going on and, and how it would relate to old age and when you're just born, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, um, right after I got out of graduate school, I made a presentation on my findings at, at the um, Autism 2000 Congress in Glasgow, Scotland. And um it was just really obvious that nobody knew about how this worked. Even in my in the biology department, nobody knew how it worked. In the neuroscience department, nobody knew how, how it worked. So that's why it really became my thing. And then right after that, scientists started making all of these discoveries because they 
had techniques to start looking at, at um, DNA and my, and uh, uh, you know interactions between molecules and that sort of thing. And so what they found out was that there was a whole family of transporters, and they're called the SLC26A family. And what they do is they move sulfate across membranes. And that is probably their biological purpose. And sulfate, you know, is what, I, that was what I was studying in graduate school. So I knew everything about where sulfate goes and the type of molecules and its role in neurodevelopment and all of that sort of thing. And so when I, um, I just found out about oxalate, I was like, oh my gosh, what if oxalate is elevated in autism? And could that have to do with the reason they have problems with their, their sulfate chemistry? And so I went to explore that and they kept on making more and more discoveries about more and more transporters. And it took, I don't know, maybe 10 years. But I mean, basically the sulfate transporters all can transport oxalate. <laughs> And that means that when your body is screaming out for sulfate, which, you know, a lot of people know that sulfate is a detoxifier. And that was really where Dr. Waring was in her work, thinking about autism and Alzheimer's disease, was she was thinking more of it being a detoxifier. But in, because of my neuroscience leanings and what I'd studied, I knew that it went way far beyond that. And that is why I knew that it was a problem if oxalate would be getting into cells where, that were asking for sulfate because oxalate actually causes oxidative stress. It also gets into the mitochondrion and creates a lot of problems. And if you look in the literature about which enzymes are inhibited by oxalate, almost all of them are mitochondrial enzymes. So that tells you it gets there. And um, so this, this started to gather a lot of things that were true in autism and a lot of things that were true in a lot of chronic illness. And, um, and that is the body handles stress and handles um, both nutritional stress and handle stress that is from getting sick or, you know, some environmental thing, even having a car accident or something where still all those inflammatory factors are elevated. And um, I think one of the biggest um, holes in the way a lot of medical people think about the body is that they don't think about there being limits on how much we can detoxify and limits on how much stress we can handle. And everybody and their uncle is talking about stress. And we know that the more stress that we're under, you know, the poorer our health becomes. But there are actually metabolic reasons that that is true. And so that was basically what I was studying in graduate school. And then afterwards, as I kept pursuing the areas that I was studying, does that make sense? It makes sense. So let me see if I, let me see if I understand it. <laughs> uh, okay. So basically your body, your cells need sulfate and sulfate is a detoxifying agent, right? right. And so what you're but saying. But that's not all it does. Sure. So, so what, so I guess that's my question is what, is the actual purpose of sulfate in the body, in the cell? And why would it, why would it not? Wh because you're, what you're saying is, is that if I understand it correctly, is that the transporter that brings sulfate into the cell, which is needed in the cell for a number of reasons that you're going to tell me here in a minute, instead of okay. the sulfate jumping a ride on that transporter, that transporter is taking the oxalate into it, uh, into the cell. And it's causing issues in the mitochondria, which of course we know can, can lead to a whole bunch of cellular dysfunctions, which lead to a whole bunch of problems all throughout the body, especially the brain. So I guess my question is, is w what exactly is the purpose of sulfate and how, how does oxalate take precedence over, cell, uh, over sulfate on that transporter? 
Well, it's not that it takes precedence. It, it, it's actually there are they are exchangers. So their game is to look at the concentration on one side of a membrane and the concentration on another membrane. And they're going to even it out. So if it's higher over here, then it's going to, most of it's going to go that direction. If it's higher over here, most of it's going to go that direction. So it's, it's balance. It's trying to balance things. But oxalot, something normal to be inside of our cells. We do, uh, we can make it and our liver um, can, can generate this. And that's why there's a gen- um, several genetic disorders called primary hyperoxaluria's, and there's a genetic defect which makes it where the body starts making gargantuan amounts of this, and it is a, they are fatal diseases. If they do do not do like a liver transplant, um, so that the liver can't keep making all this oxalate, then they can die, and a lot of times. Um, they're very at risk when they get these liver transplants because they have so much oxalate that's already stored. As soon as they get a normal liver, then they get this rush of oxalate that can be damaging to the new liver. And that's, that's where I learned the most about how damaging it could be because of what it does in primary hyperoxaluria. And so anyway, so, so it's really these transporters are balancing on either side. And so, you know, when your cell is going, oh, I need more sulfate, then um, it may send signals that say, I need more sulfate so that there's more sulfate in the blood that actually gets carried into the cell when it reaches the cell. But everything is managed. I mean, we've got to, you know, get very clear that things are managed at very many different levels in the body, like there, there are transporters and there's something like a third of the genome is tra- transporters, which moves something from one side of a cell membrane to another side of the cell membrane. So it doesn't matter. You know, I hear so many people say, oh, well, I did a urine test and it said, so that means I'm high in this and low in that, or they get a blood test and it and they'll say, oh, well, it said I was high in this or low in that. But what they really aren't thinking about is that whatever goes in your urine is what the, what the kidneys have decided you don't need to retain. Because a lot of the work in the kidney is, is looking at your urine going, oh, no, no, no. I mean, looking at your blood and going, oh, no, no, we can't get rid of that. We need to keep that. And so the only thing that shows up in urine is what your body is discarding, basically. So how well does that reflect what's going on in cells? Maybe not so good unless you really know the rules. And then the other end of it is that when people measure things in blood, what is the blood? The blood is a highway. Now, I know that when you go out on the interstate that's near your house, that sometimes, and sometimes of day, you may see more 18-wheelers. And then other times of day, it might be when people are going to work and you see a lot of, you know, vehicles of all sorts going to work. And then sometimes you get on the high and everything is at a dead stop. And you don't look at all the traffic that's there and say, oh, my gosh, somebody's makers or they're making too many 18 wheelers. No, you look at the at the at the traffic, go, oh my gosh, there's either a um, traffic accident up the road or maybe they're doing construction. Well, we should look at blood levels of things in kind of the same way. They don't necessarily represent what's going on in cells but we can't have people doing biopsies of our tissues and even if they if they biopsied your skin or they biopsied your liver or they biopsied your kidney or they biopsied your lungs they would not even get the same results 
So, so we do need to keep a healthy skepticism and just looking more broadly about what these lab tests mean, because it is not the territory for somebody who has not studied the ranges of issues that can be influencing those levels. Does that make sense? So right. what yeah. the blood is bringing to your cells, I mean, first you got leaves the blood and it goes into your interstitial cyst- tissues and it kind of migrates over to where there's a cell membrane. And then whatever is there has got to cross the cell membrane. Well, it's like a lipid layer. So things that are water soluble are not going to get across unless they have some way to get across. And the way they get across is regulated. So that cell can say, oh my gosh, I really need X. And then it will put out more transporters for X so that there's more odds that whatever floating by is going to be able to get in. And so people need to understand that all of this stuff is very regulated. You take magnesium, doesn't mean that magnesium is going to um, get to where you think you need it to be a cofactor for enzyme X. We did really, I mean, it has to cross so many barriers to get to that place. And so I think that's very important for people to realize when they're thinking about, you know, use nutrition and things like that, is that part of it is nutrition, but a lot of it also is how those things are regulated in your body. Does that make sense? Right. So, so basically what I'm getting from you is that is that some of these numbers, some of these values we see on a lab test, um, it's not that we can't trust them, but it's, there's more, there's more to the story than just, than just the number because of the way, you know, kind of like you explained, you know, if the blood is a highway and there's all of these different vehicles on the highway, it's not that, or if there's like a, if there's like a lot of traffic on the highway, it's not that, you know, it's because there's more of these than we think. Sometimes it's because of just essentially the flow of the way that they're being put into the blood. And so yes. that's being, that's being essentially regulated through these cellular membranes and the cellular membrane is kind of communicating a lot of times through these different transporters and it's essentially trying to keep homeostasis and, and, th- and it's, just, it's just a balancing act, really, right? So, so sometimes... It is a balancing act. And I, I think we have to understand that we are exquisitely made. I mean, the regulation that is in the body is just amazing. You know, it's just kind of... <laughs> uh, my father was an attorney, and somehow I inherited his secretary's uh, IBM typewriter. And it was one of the... I mean, it was a manual typewriter, because this is many years ago. But I couldn't remember turning it over and just looking at the engineering and going, wow, just to see how beautifully it was put together. And I have that same response when I look at how how we're designed um, metabolically, because, you know, I recently got a whole genome sequencing done on me to find out all my glitches. And um, scientists really are not impressed with with a glitch unless it occurs in less than one in 100 people. And so they're really carefully studying all those defects that are found in one less than one in 100 people. And I did my whole genome and they found 200,000 of them about wow. in me. Okay. Now, I look at that and I go, oh, my gosh, if I have that many things that aren't working the way, you know, they're thought to be supposed to work, then we must have amazing redundancies in our bodies. And I think one thing that um, has escaped everybody until there was this new technology about um, 15 
years ago or something like that, when they gave us the Human Genome Project, they also developed a technique to be able to look at the genetics of the micro in our gut. And they, they knew, um, they did not know about 85% of the microbes in the gut until recently. And so there's this huge effort now to study what these microbes are doing. And so one of the things, this has been a part of the human body since it began. <laughs> basically, is we've had the microbes in our gut that were doing a lot of things, and they have 3 million genes. And we have, the human body has about 22,000, give or take. Okay. And so they, uh, they, they, their capability of handling toxic stuff nutrition out of things is just so far beyond ours and so that's something that we did not realize we didn't realize that they were actually the adapt and what that means is that so so you're a mob and you find yourself in the body of somebody who has a genetic defect in thiamine transport well maybe in order to adapt to being in that environment, um, the, the populations of microbes that can make thiamine increases. And so if you have somebody doing a lab test and going, oh my gosh, so-and-so is outside of the reference range. The reason it might be outside of the reference range is that it was trying to fix something because the microbes are the adaptive part of our bodies. We can't change our genes. We're born with whatever, you know, that I think it, for me, it was 195,000 SNPs that were rarer than 1% of the population. I can't change those. That's just how I was born. But the microbes in my gut may be able to look at some of that stuff and figure out how to adapt to it. And so we spent a lot of time in medicine thinking that, that microbes were our enemy and that when we found them, we needed to kill them. So like I do a lot of consults with people and usually what got their, them in trouble, I ask them the question at the very beginning, all right, tell me about your life, tell me about when it was fine and when things fell apart. And I would say at least 90% of the time, things fell apart when they were given antibiotics or, or antifungals. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. I'm so happy you said that um, because this is a thing I've been thinking a lot about. I, I recently did another podcast with a with a gut doctor. She runs, um, she runs this institution called the Gut Institute and she's, probably one of the most, you know, probably one of the smartest people I've talked to about the gut. And after that conversation, and then I listened back to it, the number one thing that stuck out to me was the role that antibiotics play. And this is really my question to you, because you, you are the oxalate expert, or you've done probably, as far as I know, the most research on this very specific thing. Um, and her and I got into this a little bit, but the relationship between antibiotics and oxalate intolerance, because what she told me is that when they study the blue zones, you know, the highest percentage of centenarians in the world, these different places, was that they found that they had diets that were actually very high in oxalate, but the oxalate didn't bother them because they had the correct gut bacteria, the oxalobacter um, microbes that can yes. metabolize the oxalate. It's not just alabacter either. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I have been following the work of a scientist named Aaron Miller, who's been looking a lot at oxalate, and he studied um, a long time, well, for a long time, he studied the wood rats that live out in the, in the desert. And so most of the cacti that are out there are high oxalate. And so it was a great model system for him to study because he found many more oxalate degrading species in the wood rats than he does in human beings. But 
he did a lot of experiments on that. And what he found was if they made a probiotic of all the oxalate degrading microbes they found in the wood rats and then tried to just give that to them and see if that would make them able to degrade oxalate, the answer was no. The oxalate degrading microbes need the presence of the other microbes in order to effectively degrade oxalate. Yeah. And that seems to be the story with a lot of gut bacteria, which is, you know, we have this fascination of just loading up with probiotics so that we can have all the good and then we get rid of the bad. But, you know, it sounds like to me that what you actually need is you need that symbiotic relationship. You know, it's like, it's like a rock album, right? It's like, it's like a rock band. Okay. Uh, It's like the scorpions. Okay. It's like you go and when you see the scorpions, you want to hear rock you like a hurricane and you want to hear, you know, bad boys running wild. You want to hear all the heart, but then you want to hear wind of change. You want them to slow it down a little bit because the, the slow song, you know, and all the hair bands had like those hard rock songs and they had like a couple of slow so they want to slow it down because it actually made the the harder songs more powerful and it almost kind of seems to me and maybe this is the only time in history anybody's compared gut bacteria to hair rock the way that you're that you're looking at that I but do. it's but, it, but it's great. like it's like you need that relationship you 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 need the bad there to help essentially make the good even stronger well, I think, I think you see that a lot in biology. You know, like when people are talking about oxidative stress, there's some things in your body where you need oxidative stress. Like when you're going to kill a microbe, you have these cells that engulf them, and then they want to give them whack. You know, here's a whole bunch of oxidative stress to kill you, basically. Um, and, and so I do think, you know, there's that that old saying, yin yang or whatever, like we need a little bit of everything. And when we when we get to you, you know, it's like we're always on the boat. And then we hear some guru say X, and then everybody goes, Yoop! and everybody's on one side of the boat, and the boat starts to tilt over that direction. Yeah. And then, you know, somebody else will say something else, then everybody goes, oh, let's go over this way. And um, we really do need balance, not only in um, uh, what we hear, what you were talking about in music, but, you know, just the way our nervous systems work. You know, I don't know, but you probably can think of a time when you went into a concert And you walked in the door and the music was so loud that you didn't even know how to put one foot in front of the other. It was just so loud. It just kind of made your nervous system go bananas. And I think that oxalate to the microbes in our gut, they are, it is a signaling molecule in nature. It is provides short distance signaling between fungus and bacteria. Okay, so it means something very different to our microbes than it means to us. Okay, and so, you know, right now we're dealing with this COVID-19 thing. And so people are trying to adapt. Right. And some of the adaptation is stay home. And other adaptations is maybe the way that you buy groceries is different from how you did before. We are adaptive creatures. We, we, um, we see a situation change here, and then we have these adapt- adaptations. And, and so are the microbes in our gut doing that. That is their job, to adapt in ways that we can't adapt. Yeah, And so we don't need to be thinking of them as getting an overgrowth because, you know, it do- that doesn't even make any sense if you start studying microbiology because, you know, these populations get bigger and smaller all the time. That's their life of get- expanding in their populations. And for a physician to go and go, that well, it needs to be within a reference range. 
uh, why and which population did you put in your reference range? And I, I've been trying to find that out, actually. I've been trying to find out where the labs that are generating these tests that people that are saying people are in overgrowth, where are they getting their data? Like, is there is there a place where uh, they can say that it's normal to be, um, if you're in X situation, it's normal for that particular microbe to get higher because it's doing something good for you. Not that it's bad and an overgrowth, but it's trying to do something good for you. And so I've been talking to a lot of microbiologists about this, and they're trying to figure out what they're doing mm -hmm. because now they have techniques to do that. And they're trying to figure out, well, how do fungus and bacteria talk to each other? And do they need each other? And what they're finding is that they form pairs. Like this kind of fungus pairs up with this kind of bacteria and they accomplish a goal together. I mean, isn't that a crazy idea? It's so wild what's going on down there. And, you know, it's even more amazing to me that we live in this 2020 world where what you're saying is kind of the frontier of, of the gut, med but, but the gut bacteria treatments, like the protocols, um, you know, like the, the probiotic market and the prebiotic market and all of these digestive enzymes and all these, I mean, this is a billion dollar industry. So essentially what they're saying is we got it figured out. We're ready to make money off of it. And the truth of it is, is like when all of those products were created, we knew so little about what is actually happening. Case in point, you know, I've used, I don't want to say the name of the product, but it's a very popular, um, anti-fungal um, botanical um, product. And a lot of practitioners swear by it. And, um, and, I, and I got it and I used it and, it and it didn't really do anything for me. All I would hear on, on, online are, oh my God, I use this product and it's amazing. And the whole purpose of it is, is it goes in and it, it, um, it pierces through biofilm and then it goes in and does this antifungal activity. And you're really one of the first people I've heard talk and say, look, we're not talking about candida correctly. We're not having the right conversation about fungus because we can't just go in and try to eliminate all of this because it has a biological purpose. And even the, the, the gut doctor who had on the podcast said the same thing. Like, yes, fungus has the purpose of essentially um, chelating heavy metals out of the body. You know, it does a lot of stuff. And if it's there biologically, then it has a biological purpose. And, you know, it's kind of like that Bruce Lee thing. Instead of trying to fight the energy, we should really be working with the flow of it. And, um, and I just think that I think what you're saying is so, is so timely. And, and that might be the next turn that we need to take in this, in understanding the gut biome. Well, I got that 85% figure, you know, that we only knew 15% from, a man that was introduced at a conference that I went to, I'm not a conference, it was it was actually Grand Rounds at a hospital. And and but he was introduced as one of the fathers of modern microbiology. And he had about 500 studies to his name. And when we when we were off um, while I was there, he told me that we only know about 15% of the microbes in the gut. This was 20 years ago. Okay. That's what he told me. We do not know about 85% of the microbes in the gut. So all of the strategies that are older than 20 years, if they were using them 20 years ago, that means they were used before we understood what anything about the 85%. Now, now you and I know that, you know, You've heard the expression of sophomoric opinion about something where, you know, you, you, you're going to college and you're a sophomore and then suddenly you're learning all this stuff that you never knew and you're thinking, oh, I'm so smart. And then, you know, you run into a senior and they're looking at you going like, oh, gosh, I wish they would grow up, you know, and, right. you know, there's so much they don't know yet. 
Yeah. And, and that's really where we've been. We, we did not know how much we didn't know. And so, you know, of course, every professional wants to act confident about what he knows. And so what people were trained in medical school, think about how old they are. Okay, if you go to a doctor who's 30 years old, when did he go to medical school? When did his, he do his undergraduate biology stuff and, and all of that? And you, you start to realize, oh my gosh, they don't know about this stuff. They've never heard about this new change in the science and this new way of looking at everything because it hadn't happened yet when they went to medical school. So they're going to be doing what they heard to do when the science was based on 15% instead of 100%. And, and now we're learning about the 100%. And, you know, I'm not saying we're finished, you know, that the microbiologists are finished at all because they're just, you know, barely getting started. Yeah. Well, this is why I, I, I love the conversation of oxalate because, you know, right now what you have is the vegan diet and the vegetarian diets, I mean, exploding specifically the vegan diet. And I, and I went down that road myself and, you know, I don't want to get into a, a, a thing. And I know you, you wouldn't go there either of like, you know, <laughs> why one diet is better than another or why no, it's insufficient. No, I mean, we, we have strict rules about talking that way on our right. group because it's so it's not it's religion, really. But at the same time, um, you know, I'm hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about um, about really what the oxalates do in the body, specifically in the mind and, and really where they're found. Because, you know, when I started doing my research, I was just shocked because, you know, the, the conversation in health is really all about it's about fat protein and carbohydrates, right? And then, you know, we'll talk about sugar. We'll talk about high fructose corn syrup. And then if you get really into the, some weeds, you'll start talking about processed food ingredients. But when you start digging into the oxalates, it's so nefarious because this is all the health foods. This is all the the, the leafy greens and the nuts and, and all the things you're like, well, this is what I was thought I was supposed to eat. And now you're telling me that, there's a problem with spinach. Popeye right. ate spinach. How could how how could Popeye have steered me wrong for so many years? And well, it, may I tell you a little history of all that? Oh, please do. Okay. Um, I used to be able. Uh, well, there were certain um, studies that you could just download off of PubMed, and then some of the journals decided to restrict the ones that they used to not restrict. But one of the studies that I found, two of the studies I found were in the journal of nutrition, you know, which is, you know, your standard journal that all of the people that study that, you know, publish in and have for just probably a hundred years. I don't know. Um, I don't remember how old they are, but but anyway, so I found these two studies that were from the 1930s, and they were very simply designed. They took two groups of rats, and they fed them all a basal diet, which had, you know, a whole bunch of stuff in it. But they wanted to supply the calcium by some kind of green. Okay, and so in one group, they used um, spinach and the other group, they used turnip grains or another study actually had a whole bunch of things like kale and, and whatever. And so they knew the oxalate content of all of these different grains. And so what they did is they found that the ones that they spend that, that they serve spinach daily, like this is just a regular part of their diet they grew to half their size. Get that. Wow. The rats could not grow farther than half their size. Now, not only that did they find, they also found they couldn't reproduce. There was one set of pups that was made and the mother instantly ate them. 
Wow. That's the spinach okay, group. This is in the spinach group. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then they also looked at their bones and there was no mineral in their bones. They could just go like this with their bones because their teeth did not calcify. Um, there were so many problems in these rats where this happened to. And, you know, when I saw that study, of course, I was excited about it because I was studying oxalate and I thought, oh, my gosh, here's the proof. Because they didn't do anything except feed them. That's all they did. There was nothing in the study besides just feeding them food. OK. And, and these rats were so messed up when they were fed spinach every day. And I hear of people doing spinach smoothies three times a day. Yeah. You know. And and so we're doing this because of marketing. Now, when I looked at the date of that study, it was in 1938, 1939. Guess when Popeye started to talk about spinach? Oh, man, I feel like it's going to be in the 1940s. Late 1930s and early 1940s. That's wow. when suddenly it was a it was a attempt to defend the market. And I have this, this picture of this graph of spinach consumption in the U.S. And in the 1940s, it was huge. And then it went down and dipped down into 1970s, which was when I was in high school. And, um, and then it started to creep up again. And now it's probably as high as it was in the 40s, if not higher. I don't know. I don't think I don't think they're saying yet it's as high as it was in the 40s. That's but interesting. Why did it slough off like that? We are so subject to marketing. I think that's one of the things we need to go, oh my gosh. Was that just marketing? <laughs> so, the you're reason? so 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 are you saying then that after they did that study? The, the people at, I don't know, Big Spinach saw that, okay, there's some bad press going on with spinach. So how are we going to sell more spinach? They got Popeye. Popeye is talking about eating spinach straight out of the can. No, no preparation, just straight out the can. Um, he's getting Making his big muscles strong. and he's strong. And he's, I mean, he's ripped. You know, he's not just like, he's not just like big bulky muffin top strong. Like we see a lot of dudes walking around with now, like he's got big fat arms and a, and a slender waist and he's look, he looks good for a sailor. Right. And then you're saying at that point, that's when spinach went up. And then as Popeye became less popular, it went down. And now with really the rise of kind of the modern day, you know, health, uh, niche, uh, 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 I'd say like online Where health are influencer. they getting that information? What they're advertising to us, who are they presenting studies to you? No, just every every cooking show on TV starts having spinach. Why do you think they do that? It's marketing. So how much are we going to let ourselves be be led around by marketing? I mean, right. we really need to find out what the facts are. And obviously, people in the 40s weren't looking for facts. They were just paying attention to a sailor man. What does a sailor man know about nutrition anyway? I thought sailors just pulled into port and then drank a bunch of beer and <laughs> went to whorehouses. And, you know, I thought I didn't realize they were sitting around eating spinach all day. But, you know, my history could be a little off. I don't think it is. <laughs> So the thing with oxalates, though, too, is that they they bind to minerals because um, yes, and and that's well, that was what was so messed up in these animals is that their teeth they have pictures in the studies of their teeth and there's no minerals in them. You know, they're usually the mineral mineralized area in your teeth is big and it's just it it looks completely different because it does not have the minerals in there. And so we, even to this day, I don't think the standard oxalate research that's being done for people with primary hyperoxaluria, I don't think they're looking at mineral metabolism issues. 
And um, we actually took some people to one of their conferences. And, you know, I had gotten kind of immune to it because I had heard it. I mean, I knew that what their slant and how they thought was, but these other people didn't know that. And so they heard these people talking about, like um, at this particular conference, about a young man that had died of primary hyperoxaluria. And he was from India or Pakistan. And they were showing him eating extremely high oxalate food. And they didn't even think to maybe it would be better if they didn't. And so the people that I took with me were just like, oh, my gosh, why, why didn't they even look at that? And so they also, you know, when they were looking at, you know, their high fatality rate and things like that, it's like they did, you know, some of it, they they may chelate them. I'm not chelate. That's the wrong word. I'm sorry. They may, may uh, use dialysis to try to get some of the oxalate out. But what, um, what happens when you do dialysis, it, it takes some of the oxalate out, but immediately it comes back out of the tissues because it's in higher concentration in the tissues than it is in the blood and interstitial tissues. And so that's why you have this outward direction as soon as you have a liver transplant. And that gets so extreme that it kills the liver that they just transplanted or, or, and or, and usually they, they do the kidney at the same time. Right. Okay. So this is, this is interesting. So, because, you know, I think when, first of all, I don't think the common person knows about oxalate, you know, no, um, no. Uh, but I think when you, if somebody has a familiarity with oxalate, I think the first the, the first thing they know is is the kid they think kidney stones right, right. because that's what um, well that's what the that's what the actual medical field that looks at oxalate has been totally one thing oriented that they, right. they did not they didn't make it possible for you to measure oxalate levels outside the kidney now when we started using organic acid testing they had oxalate on the test so I was measuring you know, all kinds of populations. And then what I found is that oxalate is elevated in a lot of people with chronic pain syndromes mm -hmm. and with people with fatigue issues and people, you know, you're, you're really concerned about people with um, more mental health issues. And we had a huge number of people who joined our group, found out their oxalate was low, was high, I'm sorry, and lowered the oxalate. And after about six months or so, a lot of them started talking to each other on the on my group and they were saying, oh my gosh, I've been anxious for years and I've been on this all this anti-anxiety medication. I don't need it anymore. Well, that's, that's where I think th that's, that's what really fascinates me about the oxalate conversation. And I think it goes back to what we actually started the conversation with, which is the, the sulfate transporter mechanism where, so if you're the type of person who you're, you're consuming a lot of oxalate, it almost sounds like the body starts getting flooded with oxalate and then taking it one step further. If you don't have the specific microbes in your gut that can properly metabolize oxalate, which in 2020 with the amount of antibiotics that, you know, so much of us in the population have taken, chances are we don't. <laughs> and, you know, we, we have these, we start getting these health issues and we say, well, I got to get healthy. What do I do? I start drinking spinach smoothies and I eat nuts and I do all this stuff. And then I start dousing my Myself with with oxalate the oxalate goes in the blood the sulfate transporter starts seeing excessive amounts of oxalate and they go well we you know we have to it almost sounds like it prioritizes it because there's so much of it available starts bringing that into the mitochondria and i'm sure for like you said genetics is more of a of a of a system of 
transporters and enzymes and reactions. And so if you have, depending on what your genetic code is, those oxalates are going to go into these different places. And for some people, it manifests as joint pain or muscle pain. For some people, it's fatigue. And then for a lot of people, it's depression and anxiety because it, you're literally slowing down the ability of the mitochondria to properly produce ATP. And so, you know, again, this could take the form of, you know, thyroid issues. It could take the form of, of a million different reasons why you would have anxiety and depression. Is, is that about like, right? Because that, that's kind of what absolutely, I'm getting from this conversation. Absolutely. But the thing that I want to kind of um, slip over into since you mentioned it was the thyroid, because there are studies where they have done autopsies on babies that died. And, you know, I mean, obviously you wouldn't do an autopsy unless somebody was dead, right? And so, uh, but they've looked at infants and they've looked at all different ages. And they, they actually did studies where they did consecutive autopsies of the ne next hundred people that came into the morgue, okay? And they took out their thyroid gland and they analyzed it for oxalate content they found that even in infancy, your thyroid starts to accumulate oxalate. And they also know from other studies that oxalate makes you hypothyroid or, you know, we still, you know, there, there is a, an autoimmune condition called um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And, and with it, there's kind of this bouncing around stuff with, with the, um, um, how that autoimmune disease is affecting how your thyroid functions. But at any rate, it's damaging to the thyroid for it to be there. And, and it is just like, you know, goodness knows we've heard about cholesterol, you know, and, oh, you don't want to have too much cholesterol and it's going to, you know, collect in your blood vessels. And when you get older, it's going to be a big problem, right? That's what, what we generally say. Well, oxalate is just like that. The older you are, the longer you have had to accumulate it. Now, people are doing an incredible job right now because they're drinking spinach, spinach smoothies and doing beets and nuts and seeds and all these kinds of things. So they're probably accumulating oxalate in their body at an astonishing rate. Now, why does it collect in the thyroid particularly? Well, most people know about there's a relationship between the thyroid gland and iodine, right? Well, iodine is also one of the things that crosses the membrane on those SLC26A transporters. Now, there are some other iodine transporters, but some of the iodine transporters are in the same family that also moves oxalate. So it, it matters. Um, uh, and is it safe to say that if you're getting more oxalate, then you're probably not getting enough iodine? Or, or does oxalate yeah, bind well, to iodine? It, it may, it, it, it very well may affect it because, again, if these are exchangers. And I think the best way to think about this is like a, you know, at those grand old hotels when they had the big, um, uh, revolving entrance mm -hmm. where you just push it and it goes around. But let's just say it was like that, except there was a rule that the only way that you could get in is if somebody were coming out at the same time, because that's mm -hmm. how these transporters work. Interesting. Now, pretend for a moment that there is a blue shirt convention going on inside the hotel, right? Now, you're just somebody on the street, right, just walking up and wanting to get into the hotel. But since it takes someone coming out for you to go in, then there's going to be, because everybody that's at this convention is wearing a blue shirt, then they come out and they want to go outside, right, because they had a break time or something. So all of these blue shirts are wanting to become out, but you don't look like anything else, particularly. I mean, you're just in your regular clothes. So maybe you don't stick out as, you know, having any particular color shirt, but you're going in. But you're noticing that, oh, my gosh, all these people coming out have blue shirts. It's not like that. 
they're exchangers. So it depends on what the concentration is on this side or that side. Sure. So, uh, and this is real interesting. Um, you know, a, a thing that I, I've learned from your group and the people in your group is this idea uh, of oxalate dumping. So yes. when people start to, so, so when they make that connection and they, they start to learn about oxalate and they go, oh my God, this is the thing that I've tried everything else. I've, I've, I was a vegan or I was a vegetarian and I was just eating, I was drinking, you know, spinach smoothies and I was eating, you know, uh, cashew butter and almond butter and all these things every day, all day. And I was just trying to lose weight and I felt worse and worse. And then they go, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one plus one equals two. I'm going to stop eating oxalates, cold Turkey. And, and you go then, look on the internet and you find a list and you think, okay, I'm just going to eat low oxalate food. Right. right. And for a lot of people I know uh, that takes the form of like the carnivore diet, which is, um, yeah which is so bonkers. <laughs> but uh, again, nothing, nothing surprises me anymore. Everything is fair game, right? Um, but then what starts to happen is they start experiencing uh, almost like these physical withdrawal symptoms. So, so maybe you could explain a little bit this phenomenon of oxalate dumping, because I think you alluded to it a little bit earlier about how the oxalates store in the tissues, and then it goes back to this idea of homeostasis in the blood, right? the blood's always trying to keep this level of oxalate once it gets to a certain level. Well, I don't think oxalate's really regulated in the blood. I mean, it, 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 there is a certain sense in which, and I don't think they figured out exactly what it is, but there is some kind of sensor that senses when the blood levels get high and then it may secrete it to the gut. But exactly. there's also some signaling that's, looked for in the gut that says it's okay to do that. So there's kind of a two-way conversation going on here. All right. So if the microbes are there that can degrade it, then you're going to get more coming through. So there's some sort of signals that the microbes give the intestinal cells that say, we're here, we can do it. And, and, and then that encourages the oxalate to go from the blood into the intestine. And that's why uh, some people get like really bad diarrhea or, you know, they have some kind of change in their um, gastrointestinal function when they're dumping, but not everybody. And we certainly don't understand all the ins and outs of this because some people like I'm what's, what's called a skin dumper. It means that when I eat oxalate, I, it comes out my skin. My gastrointestinal system and eh. I mean it doesn't even notice what's going on but I I get I've had these terrible rashes all over and they look kind of like poison ivy but all over your body I mean it, for me and it's only on one side mostly which is weird and and uh um I have MS and my MS was on one side of my body affected and the other wasn't. And so, I mean, who knows what, all, what goes into all of this. But, but anyway, one of the things that was kind of peculiar is when I had a rash on my left leg and I, had, I did not get a rash at all on my right leg, okay, when this happened. Um, after it was over and the rash was gone, I looked down and I'm one of these people that has had coagulation issues. And so I had these little bruises kind of along my ankles and the bruises where I had the rash were gone. That's after you stopped the oxalates? No, after, after the, the, the stump that created the big rash was gone, mm -hmm. then there was no more of the bruising stuff that was had been there for years. Wow. It was gone, but it was still present on my right side because it didn't have that experience. Yeah. It was very localized to that place. And so there are a lot of things that we don't understand about this process. Why some people are skin dumpers, why some people are gastrointestinal. Some people are more urinary, you know, and, um, it, it might even be intense enough to create a kidney stone even uh, mm -hmm. when they are 
going through this process and they may not have had a kidney stone until they started dumping and then suddenly they have a kidney stone. And it's not that we're inventing oxalate, it's that the oxalate was stored somewhere in their body. And we don't know that much about it except through studying the literature on these people that have the genetic defect. And they basically found oxalate everywhere. And is that like a situation, like, for example, the kidney kind of like the gut where when you say, OK, I'm going to go cold turkey on these oxalates and then you start you, you basically cut off the supply and then the oxalate starts coming out of the body. Well, the kidneys like, well, where'd all these oxalates go? And then it starts pulling the oxalate from the is it from the well, blood? I don't think the- it would be right to say it's pulling it out. It's just uh-huh. part of its normal biology to have sulfate transporters. Got you. Exactly got you. Wow. Right. Right. We can't think about this stuff as being all that intentional, although I do think it is legitimate to think in our design that we were designed to tolerate a certain amount of oxalate. And we were also designed for the microbes that are in our gut to degrade them for us. And then what they didn't degrade, we would poop out, you know, like that. But But we were designed to get rid of them. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting is I I ran into at a conference many years ago, a um, a veterinary, uh, a PhD scientist type person who was at the San Diego Zoo um, studying koala bears. And you know that they just eat one thing, right? And that one thing is very high oxalate. Most of the most of the koala bears die from kidney failure. Oh no way! Okay. Okay, and so this scientist, we were in a in a you know food line together for thirty minutes at least, and so he got to talking to me about how he thought about this, and he said, for one thing, one of the one of his interests was he said I think oxalate is to koala bears as Um, gluten is to human beings. Mm -hmm. In other words, they eat it because they're addicted to it. And it's not that it's that good for them, but they go back to it every time. And what he told me while we were in that line is that they're actually carnivores. Like everything about their physiology is that they should be carnivores, but they only eat um, eucalyptus. So um, that was a very interesting conversation. I'm so glad I had it because at least me, it got me thinking about what we do when we get addicted to something. And a lot of times that when we're first doing it, we're just thinking, oh, this is great. You know, I heard an interview last night of Jer- uh, George Harrison, you know, one of the Beatles, with um, Dick Cavett, and he was talking about when they had their first encounter with LSD. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I mean, you know, they were experimenting, but he, they certainly didn't, I mean, he couldn't, he, at that point, when he was doing this interview, he couldn't see what was coming down the line about, you know, how people would get so addicted to it and, you know, that kind of thing. But for, for them, it was just, oh, in this cool voice, need to get high you know well it's like it's it's like potato chips right it's like what are potato chips it's just essentially cardboard you know it's essentially just fried uh canola oil with uh all these different um chemicals in it and you know it's a it's a straight up poison to the body but for some reason it's like you can you know a person but can crush a couple bags <laughs> you cannot eat just one right and then you do that day after day and you know maybe like somebody's looking outside of us like how do they keep eating these potato chips <laughs> like don't they realize it's like it's literally killing them and then you know you can't you look at somebody enjoying uh, you know a bag of potato chips and it and the math of it doesn't make sense but when you're when you're in it you know it's like the koala bear eating the the eucalyptus it's like maybe biologically it's it's like that same kind of you know poison reward system that we have in us the same thing that you know that lsd does to uh, a person or, or some kind of drug or alcohol or something you know it's not good for the body but you know there's something about it that 
psychologically it, it satisfies a place for us. Well, I, I recently um, did a look, I found a study that was talking about alcoholism and um, and how it works. And it was actually saying that it makes sense if you have thymine problems for um, taking alcohol to kind of take the the edge off of how your body is processing things because of its thymine deficiency. And that may be how people initially get really sunk into alcohol is that they're they're trying to solve one problem and then but the alcohol itself creates problems and also creates a problem of needing more thiamine. And yeah. so it ends up but but one many many years ago I had a, a friend that brought this other person to church and we were right behind them but the the guy was going through DTs and I had never seen somebody going through that. And he was just lying out. It wasn't, a, they had just chairs, but it was like he was in the pew in front of me and he was so miserable and looking at him, I could understand why if you had that, that he was experiencing that if you knew that you could just take another little thing of alcohol and then stop that process, you would do it. I mean, I, it was totally understandable. Why, when somebody gets to that sh- position that they would want to just stop the process by getting more alcohol? And I think that's what we're doing with oxalate is that when when we, you know, we feel so, oh, that I feel so good when I'm doing my spinach smoothies and then they quit doing the spinach smoothies and the next day they feel horrible. And that's because the body's going, oh, now finally I can get rid of it. And so it starts to put it out in the blood and then you feel horrible. So this is a problem with this process and it's why, um, through experience, I mean, we've we've talked to more than fifty thousand people reducing oxalate, and um, and we um, quickly learned that um, you do not need to get a low oxalate list and suddenly go on a low oxalate diet. We do not approve of doing that because we've talked to too many people from the emergency room. And I am serious. They call me from the emergency room. And what they tell me is the emergency room doctor does not know what to do. Because wow. they're not familiar with it. Okay. So, it's, I mean, they're just looking at a person detoxing from oxalate and are like, I have no idea. They have you, no you, you, idea. I thought you were healthy. <laughs> no. And this one man, this just really broke my heart. And he was... I mean, I don't know how how old he was, but he was pretty old. And he decided to just quit eating oxalate, you know, altogether against our recommendations because we don't tell anybody to do that. And what he did is he ended up in the emergency room. And what they did is they put him in a room by himself for four hours and they did nothing to him. They just said he had a psychiatric problem. And then when he when he got home, he got a bill for five thousand dollars, and it it put him into bankruptcy. Whoa! So so we don't <laughs> want that to happen. You don't to want anybody. that to happen, right? So no, so, so no, folks. No. So this leads me, I guess, to my last question then, which is: You are an oxalate junkie, not you, but let's say hypothetical person listening to this, you hypothetical person listening to this, you are an oxalate junkie and you're hearing Susan Owens talk all about how, you know, oxalates work in the body and you decide, okay, maybe oxalates are my issue. What do you recommend? Because you, what you're saying is you don't just want to cut oxalate cold Turkey. What is the best way to go about it? Or maybe like in the easiest way you can explain, because I know it's very nuanced and, you know, complicated and, and I'm sure you're available to work with people if they need it. Um, but what can they do diet wise? What can they do lifestyle wise? And even more important, what can they do supplement wise? 
Okay. Well, one of the things is we started um, our trying low oxalate group first on Yahoo, and then then we started our Facebook group, and the Facebook group just grew like crazy. And we we have put on trying low oxalates all kinds of resources to tell you how to do this. And one of the things we make very clear is don't try to reduce oxalate by more than five to ten percent a week. Now, you can't do that if you just pick up a list that says these are extra high oxalate, and this is high oxalate, and this is medium oxalate, et cetera, because you can't make it that nuanced. And that's why we have on our group a spreadsheet group, group which is copyrighted not by us, but by another organization that also did a lot of the testing. Okay. And so, anyway. We um, have on there how much oxalate is in whatever you eat. Hopefully, we have been complete enough in 15 years to cover whatever you eat. And so what you do is you go through there and figure out how much oxalate you've been eating. And then you do the calculations to say, okay, I need to cut this by 10, 5 to 10% a week. That means it will take you 10 to 20 weeks to get down to a low oxalate diet. And that is what works best in not putting you into that terrible situation like the DTs. That makes sense. Okay. Does that make sense? That does. And then, and, oh, go ahead. Sorry. And uh, I mean, there are some things that help in particular situations. One thing is we know that oxalate, when it is circulating through your blood, is going to, it has two negative charges on it. So it's going to grab up minerals, whatever minerals. I mean, it really, if you go on the internet and type in your favorite mineral and oxalate, you will see a picture come up of what copper oxalate looks like and what magnesium oxalate looks like and what iron oxalate looks like, etc. Because they all have that double charge that ends up engaging the double charge, double negative charge on oxalate. And so it messes up your, your mineral chemistry. And we're not all alike the way our mineral chemistry is messed up. I mean, some of us have issues more with iron and some of us have more issues with copper or whatever. And so what we recommend then is to take minerals. And, and so two of the minerals that have, you know, most effects in the gut are magnesium and calcium. And so often, because this is what they used in the kidney field, we use citric acid like magnesium citrate or um, calcium citrate. And, uh, but we also learned because, you know, we have people with all sorts of disorders. A lot of the people with pain disorders like interstitial cystitis, they cannot take that. The citric acid bothers them. So they need to go for a different kind, okay? So there's some nuances to it, and we do try to cover that on our group, and there's certainly not a way in this lecture that I can tell you, you know, all the nuances there. But I just encourage people to join one of our groups, either trying low oxalates at a fa that is a Facebook group. There's also an IO group, and there's also a Yahoo group. Yahoo disemboweled itself. They do not allow us to put any files or any resources on their group. All it is is a mailing list. Mm. So um, that might suit some people, but for most people, it's not enough. And, and they might want to go to the other groups. But we have the resources to help you. I would, I would personally vouch for the Facebook group. I think of any group I'm on on Facebook, and I'm in a lot of them, uh, your group has the most education in it by far. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how you don't charge for it. <laughs> you can make a lot of money because um, it is that valuable. Please don't start charging for it. I'm, I'm very broke. No, um, well, but <laughs> I mean, I do that because when I entered into this, I realized that the only way we could find out who has an oxalate problem is to just leave the doors open. Yeah. You know, if I put up obstacles and I wanted to be the great guru that made a lot of money, um, then it, it would subterfuge my efforts in trying to find out how broad is this? Because we certainly don't want to go say it affects these people because Susan thinks so. 
Right. What do I know? I mean, I, I haven't lived in your body. Right. And so what oxalate does to you is something that's individual. It's based on the uniquenesses and your your what you inherited from your parents and grandparents. And believe me, you know, it depends on what what your what your you, you get your microbes in the birth canal and you also get them from breast milk. Well, somebody got the wise idea some years ago that, oh, people just need to have soy formula or whatever. Or they also got the idea to give antibiotics to a woman when she's giving birth sometimes. Mm. I mean, they're, 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 and that compromises the microbes that the baby gets. The fact that, you know, you have the service, I can't thank you enough for it. Go on over to the Triangle Oxalate Group uh, on Facebook if you, uh, if you have been um, at all moved by this conversation. You know, we've just barely even scratched the surface on, you know, uh, the things that Susan discusses as far as oxalates. I mean, you have uh, a lot of resources on the inflammasome, which is so uh, relevant to what's going on with COVID. And, it, and, and I'm slowly starting to hear it talk talked about more in the somewhat mainstream literature. And, and you're the first person I heard talking about this. So uh, definitely check out that group. It's a hundred percent worth it. Join it. There's so many helpful people there. And if nothing else, just go through the, the previous conversations, you know, it's almost like you could just put something into that search bar uh, you know, your condition and you'll see multiple threads of people who are going through the same thing you're going through and you will, you'll have a lot of really amazing insight. And so, um, Susan, I, I can't thank you enough for, for, for having that resource for joining me today on the podcast. Um, is there anything else you'd like to leave the listeners with or, or the viewers, uh, before we sign off? Well, I would like to just say that it became a buzzword. And so it came, uh, it, it, Oxalate became something that would give somebody website clicks. And so there's a lot of information on the internet that is not correct and not accurate. And they just don't know the science because they just thought, oh, if I use oxalate, it'll make people come to my website. So be careful about that. And that's kind of why we tried to make our group um, where you could really get the, the science. Um, integrity. That's, that's the most important thing. And that's, unfortunately lacking from so much of the health and nutrition conversation. So um, thank you again, Susan. Uh, again, check out the Triangle Oxalates group on Facebook. We'll put all of your uh, resources in the show notes and in the podcast description here so people can find you if they like to work with you. Um, we'll make that all available for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been great. Absolutely. And thank you for listening and watching this podcast. If you enjoyed it, please remember to subscribe and leave a nice review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. And be sure to check out holisticnootropics.com for the full show notes of this podcast and all the archives of all the podcasts that we've done previous to this. Thank you so much for listening and watching. We'll catch you on the next one. Peace. for listening. For more brain boosting info, in-depth articles and show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com.